He is a research fellow at Center for Ethics of Science and Technology of Toronto University, Bangkok, Thailand. He is a visiting senior research fellow at United Nations University, Institute of Advanced Studies, UNIS. He is an affiliated professor in philosophy, Kumamoto University, Japan. He is a se senior research scholar of Fulbright Academy of Law, Peace and Public Health. So please welcome Professor David R. J. Messer to talk about research ethics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the kind welcome. And we wanted to uh, talk uh, about the uh, yeah, what are the uh, <coughs> ethics and it's uh, then goes into research ethics. Good. So we have a. Uh, I want to cover both uh, aspects. Firstly, uh, you may have heard of the term bioethics. Uh, ethics is a bridge between societies, a bridge between uh, researchers, a bridge between the, uh, the public. Um, it was first used uh, by a uh, German called Fritz Jahr in 1927. He wrote a paper called The Bioethical Responsibilities of Human Beings to Plants and Animals. In 1990, Van Potter wrote a book in English, Bioethics Bridge to the Future. But the concepts of bioethics, as we will see, are much older. Um, it has a linkage to uh, medical ethics. Uh, you have probably heard of uh, Nuremberg trials. Uh, the war trials where some Nazi doctors were convicted, 17, and some of them were executed. Uh, it's a rather interesting story of uh, medical research ethics because the code by which they were executed was a code that was uh, told to the court was widely accepted and used in the United States. In fact, that was a lie. The code was hastily made for the court. Most US institutions did not know about the code, and it was also being broken. Uh, but that uh, still was a crush, a crush course to start research ethics. People had been appalled by the use of uh, human beings as uh, uh, experimental guinea pigs for different sorts of research studies in the concentration camps. Uh, the story is quite interesting about the, I'd say, uh, hypocrisy of this uh, judgment. <coughs> and uh, at the same time, if we were in Asia, the leading medical research facility was at Unit 731. It was the Tokyo Japanese Army Research Facility. And if I was a, you know, a researcher of microbiology, molecular biology, biochemistry, uh, medical research. From 1935 to 1945, the best place to do research was in Unit 731 in Harvard in China. It was occupied uh, by Japan. After the war, the uh, uh, research scientists in Unit 731 uh, were not prosecuted in exchange for immunity. Uh, they gave uh, all the detailed notes and files to the United States by a warfare program. Uh, a few unlucky researchers were convicted of uh, crimes against humanity in the Moscow war crimes, which most people are not aware of. There was a parallel Nuremberg trial with the Moscow trial. Uh, but because of the Cold War, um, uh, the Allies tried to suppress uh, the knowledge of the Moscow war crimes. So the ethics guidelines used to convince the Nazis, the doctors, were not actually being applied. And in addition, uh, actually the United States Department of Health was uh, promoting studies which were breaking ethical codes. Possibly the syphilis study uh, was a study from 1932 to 1972, uh, where you had a, a Negro men 
with syphilis who were left untreated in order to follow the progress of the disease. And uh, this is up to 1972. Uh, now, if you know your antibiotics, you know the antibiotics treated syphilis quite well from 1940 and so on, and used in World War II, especially when they expanded. So despite this, and through multiple reviews by ethics committees at the time, until 1972, the US Department of Public Health approved of not treating these men. Uh, eventually they received a presidential pardon uh, later because of, to the families uh, because of the abuses against them. Another interesting uh, research was the study of uh, syphilis in Guatemala. And there is a Presidential Commission on Ethics report in the United States looking at that. The United States Department of Public Health uh, decided that some of the experiments they wanted to do were not going to be accepted by the US public. Uh, so they sent them to Guatemala. And the government of Guatemala was welcoming the research funding uh, and cooperating. And uh, if any of you are involved in delivery of syphilis tests, the uh, testing of different syphilis tests was done on all prints of Guatemala to determine the best uh, uh, progress and the best diagnostic test for syphilis. They used uh, people in mental, uh, mental institutions, orphans, and soldiers. And actually they tried uh, a research study to try and infect soldiers with the prostitutes prostitutes were given syphilis, uh, they were given five minutes a soldier, and they tried to infect all the you know, hundreds of soldiers. The transmission rates of syphilis were not very good, actually. But that's their, that was their attempt. And the idea of uh, the soldiers were not told, of course, they were going to get syphilis. Um, so this is a, yeah, I don't say hypocrisy and uh, unethical. So despite the evolution of medical ethics going on on one side of the public piece of medicine, uh, at the other side, up to the highest level of the uh, government, uh, these trials are being approved. And there's a lot of documentation of the uh, level of the trial. So by ethics as a term then really uh, emerged as new technology was the catalyst for re-examination of medical ethics at the time. There were these atrocities that had been going on uh, and continuing to go on. Um, so we had an examination of medical ethics and social ethics. We have different professional fields now, medical ethics, dental ethics, public health ethics. Uh, but the similarity, I guess, is they all come under the umbrella of the bioethics. There are several ways to view my ethics. Uh, one is descriptive ethics, uh, which is the way people view life, their moral interactions and responsibilities uh, with living organisms. I have my bioethic and you have your bioethic. So we can describe that. In the academic field of bioethics, as described by uh, Professor Shamina, is uh, looking at uh, the this is trying to nurture people to build up studies, to understand our relationships with each other in the uh, medical field, environmental field, uh, professional uh, ethics. And we combine tools in anthropology, sociology, philosophy, biology, uh, in the many aspects of creating knowledge and understanding. There are some, uh, I guess, observations we can make which are quite relevant for the practice of ethics. One is that cultural homogeneity is an illusion. So let's say uh, we have an established standard in our country, Bangladesh, uh, and we think all uh, patients will be the same. The same attitudes, same beliefs, so we can apply this simple checklist and uh, do what we like to them. If we actually look at the results of the studies, when we interview people on different opinions, for example, in the life care, if you want to use a surrogate mother or not, if you want to use donor semen, if you want to share your 
blood sample with a general research pool, or uh, what's your concept of privacy? All these things uh, are different. That's why we need to ask people uh, about uh, their values. The traditional model of uh, medical ethics, uh, if I visit a doctor to see treatment, uh, we may have a paternalistic model, uh, the doctor about the patient, uh, informed consent, the doctor and patient, uh, informed choice, the patient about the doctor. And uh, you can imagine a visit to a supermarket to buy food, a visit to a pharmacy to buy drugs, could be following the same sort of model. In different countries, we're in different stages. Uh, and this transition from paternalism through choice occurs at different speeds in different countries. <coughs> yeah, I worked for many years in Japan. One of the expressions uh, patients say when they go to the hospital in Japan is I'm like a tuna on the chopping block. You know, the big tuna fish? To go to the hospital, we basically lie down on the chopping block and hit the doctor. And that's the general belief. So it's that's a rather paternalistic relationship. Um, I think that may occur in some parts of this country as well. We're trying, I guess, to move to a consent model where people can give it different options and then consent. In some aspects, we see a choice model. And our goal of bioethics is to make this an informed choice, not just a, a choice led by you know, advertising and marketing or uh, trends of the day. The information age is taking the whole of society to a choice model. Uh, you can see this in the way that people participate in decision making. The literacy rates are improving. Uh, people can read and uh, journalists can bring uh, knowledge to people. And many people now use the internet. So you can get the medical information almost unlimited on the internet. So if you have at least the growing graduate population, they should be able to understand uh, something from the uh, reading of uh, papers <coughs> on the internet. <coughs> the second view of bioethics is prescriptive ethics. Prescriptive ethics is to uh, tell others what's ethically good or what that or what principles are most important in making such decisions. It may also be to say that something or someone has rights and others have duties to them. So let's say I have a uh, uh, learned ethics in school or the ethics at home. Uh, we might be told what's good and what's bad. Later I'm going to talk about research ethics and we'll see some examples of policy statements which is sort of a saying what is uh, good and what's uh, not good. I believe uh, people need to develop the capacity to think for themselves and make a moral, morally accountable decisions themselves. So uh, we can't just rely on a policy and say, I follow the rules, so I'm ethical. Okay? Because the rules may not themselves be ethical. And sometimes the laws are rather vague or ambiguous. So what sorts of principles might we consider underlying our decisions? So one is the ethical principle of love and good and emphasis that supports the development of science and technology. That might uh, cure sick persons or feed hungry people. So the actual foundation of research is ethics. Often we find this uh, very primitive discussion that uh, science is here, ethics is here, ethics is the things I don't understand, it's very complex. But actually the foundational principle of, uh, and I would consider probably the most important principle of uh, uh, medicine is uh, an ethicism. It's a good. And uh, that's the foundation of the science and technology and what most people are trying to do in their lives. Why do you want to be a professional to help? You want to help. Okay. So that's ethics. You're doing ethics. The principle of loving others, a justice makes us consider the risks to future generations. 
the risks uh, to others? How do we share the fruits of scientific endeavor? We have uh, issues like benefic benefit sharing, affordable health care for all, public eradication. And these are because of the principle of love for others. At your hospital here, if you have a person without any money, they will come to the hospital and they can expect to get some treatment because they're a human being. That's uh, because of the principle of loving others or justice. And that happens anywhere. Uh, currently, I'm living in the United States. There is a law. Everyone who comes to an emergency room must be treated. Regardless of their insurance pay statement, their citizenship, they come to a person and are treated. Of course, they may even try and get the money from them. If they're a foreigner and left the country, they're not going to get the money. If they're a homeless person, they cannot get the money. But they are still treated. So that's a, a basic uh, right, even in a very libertarian uh, society, of uh, providing uh, emergency treatment. Um, I think that's, uh, that's important. In, uh, in most countries, uh, well, depending on the health insurance system, your, your hospitals usually are paying, you know, 20 to 20, 30 percent of patients cannot pay, uh, and so they're still going to be treated. Uh, the question, I think, is uh, that's principle of justice. It means for setting the cost for others, though, you're going to have to get the costs and recover the costs from other people. Um, imperatives of love, respect for the ethical principle of self-love, supports empowerment of people so they can access technology according to their values. So, as I said in this, when we look at the descriptive ethics aspect, we have our own values. We can try and describe those and understand those. Um, we're going to empower people to uh, find their uh, the term that's very similar, that's more commonly used in the bioethics is autonomy, which actually means self-rule. Self-rule means I can make decisions myself. Uh, that the think of self-love or that trying to live ourselves is probably uh, more foundational. Um, because in different cultures we may not get the expression of a self-rule uh, uh, so much. The conventions on human rights uh, mention that all people have a right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. This has a number of implications uh, for medicine and public health. Uh, people make uh, bad choices in our minds sometimes. They may smoke, they may eat too much, they may do very risky behavior. Uh, is the right to self-determination. As long as you don't hurt somebody else, uh, you have the liberty to do what you want to do. Um, now, of course, in our country, we try to, uh, many countries try to help people make a healthy choice. It may be compulsory vaccination, for example. Uh, it also may be trying to limit the consumption of certain substances. There will be drugs which are maybe illegal in different countries. Uh, there will be uh, behaviors uh, such as not wearing a seatbelt that you may be punished for, not wearing a motorcycle helmet that you may be punished. And it's not really hurting anybody else, it's only hurting yourself. Of course, it costs money for the health system, uh, but the primary victim is the person itself. So the global community has established uh, and agreed on three international declarations on bioethics uh, through UNESCO. Our World Health Organization also has some ethical standards on some aspects of medical care. Uh, we say all sorts of things, uh, some examples of the text, okay, well the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. Uh, Article 7, genetic data associated with an identifiable person and stored or processed for the purposes of research or any other purpose must be held confidential in a con condition set by the law. Uh, they have to have conditions set by the law because 
some is this sovereign comp nations have sometimes slightly different laws of protecting confidentiality. It's still the uh, the principle is it's confidential. Um, so that's an example of a text. Uh, this uh, text, uh, the Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights, took five years to develop. I was on a committee with 50 people from around the world. Uh, we developed uh, this declaration, ready for the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1998. Because uh, 50 years on, and the UN General Assembly wanted to celebrate with something applied to science. A genome project, uh, which uh, you, some of you and myself were involved in, may have been uh, a stimulus for global reflection. There was something, the common genome of humanity, that we thought we had to try and uh, protect. You know, it's, it's quite interesting, in some countries, the confidentiality of genes um, led to uh, uh, laws for broader protection, uh, including in the United States. In the United States, uh, in the 1990s, well, 1980s, 1990s, people might be excluded from medical insurance because of uh, their genetic genes, giving them susceptibility to certain diseases. Fortunately, uh, uh, about uh, four or five years ago, when this latest uh, Obamacare, this package has been arrived, it excludes any form of screening medical information. So nobody is, is, is uh, distinguished. And so it's actually gone uh, back from a very specialized area of genetics to anything. Family history is not relevant as well. Everyone can get medical insurance at the same rate. And it's sort of more like, somewhat more like a socialist system that was accepted widely in Europe. That you treat people as human beings, uh, and I think that's a very positive sign. In the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and uh, Human Rights in 2005, it's the only UN text really on a common framework of ethics. And we have these uh, framework of different uh, ethical principles, uh, what this meant uh, was quite significant. Firstly, all countries adopted it, meaning they need to in develop national legislation and policy to include protection of these principles. That's an obligation. It includes establishing ethics committees and a, a bioethics education. For the Secondly, in a bioethics community, such as uh, Shanima and I have been working in the Asian Biotech Association for many years. When we go to different countries, let's say I go to uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, and uh, I'm from Bhutan, or I'm from uh, Guatemala, and I go and I sit down. I don't need to spend uh, weeks just talking about general things. I can talk immediately. Well, what's your policy on Solidarity. What's your policy on the sharing of benefits from science and technology? What's your policy on consent? What's your guideline? So it means we can actually move forward in the cross-cultural bioethics very rapidly because we can now, uh, we've agreed as a country to these principles. How do we do it now in practice? Because uh, it's a practical detail which is quite helpful for guidance for researchers and scientists. A third way to view bioethics is uh, interactive ethics. It's discussion and debate between people, groups within society and communities. Such dialogue skills are necessary to live harmoniously with others. Um, I grew up in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have a tradition of uh, meetings to decide things. I think in some parts of your country you have this tradition as well, community meetings. What's interesting is uh, uh, North American or uh, bioethics has now rediscovered this idea with the uh, ethics committees. 
So ethics committees are being established, basically replicating uh, and formalizing a process of community council discussions to reach decisions. Okay, so we're going back to ancient wisdom in some sense. I want to talk a little of some, uh, 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 an example of the genetics research um, and show how we might develop the research uh, conditions in so science is uh, increasingly motivated by the philosophy of wisdom rather than knowledge. Namely, we pursue science in order to achieve some benefits for the community. Researchers are expected to involve the community in decision making about the planning, conduct, and feedback of the proposed research. Community engagement is a mutual communication to discuss about the project with a wide range of people in the society, to better understand the societal concerns and to provide an opportunity for broad public input. The practical mechanism of community engagement uh, will differ with specific genetic research being pursued. The general concept of community engagement must be applied to different situations and countries. The efforts of more than one way education from the researchers that involve the process of interactive bioethics between different parties in a community. So I try and discuss the members of the community what they might be doing. Uh, one of the ethics committees I was uh, on for, uh, for many years was the Human Genome Organization Ethics Committee. So we tried to establish, as an academics and uh, researchers, ethics standards for guidance of uh, genetics research globally. And there are a number of statements which you can see. Uh, these are uh, somewhat more practical than the UN guidelines. Uh, because they're probably written by academics and not so political. Um, and they, for example, benefit sharing, and I think this is quite relevant to some of the issues in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we recommended that all humanity share it and have access to the benefits of genetic research. The benefits not be limited to those individuals who participate in such research. Let there be prior discussion with groups or communities on the issue of benefit sharing. And even in the absence of profits, immediate health benefits as determined by community needs could be provided. But at a minimum, all research participants should receive information about general research outcomes and an indication of appreciation. That profit making entities dedicate a percentage, e.g. 1 to 3 percent of their annual net profit to healthcare infrastructure and or humanitarian efforts. And you might think, uh, point six, some people said, well, we're telling the pharmaceutical companies around the world to give 1 to 3 percent of their benefits. Actually, they were generally welcoming it, and they generally do. Uh, so the idea was, uh, how do they do the benefit sharing? Let's say I come to uh, your tribe and I take some genes from, that you have a high susceptibility to uh, diabetes. And then I promise to your community, okay, if we're going to find uh, a cure, we're going to give you access to that, that drug at a free cost. Almost never will uh, such a uh, promises being fulfilled because almost never uh, will the research actually find the cure. So you give your samples and basically you get nothing because the research is unlikely to lead to anything. Instead we thought at the beginning you, these companies come in, you set up a health center, set up a community health center, uh, train a couple of local people in health, and that's something that's going to be there. And so that was a sort of a model. And I saw that, I think the transition was very useful globally because uh, so many promises were being made in the 1990s that could never be kept. Because the results are not going to lead to any profit. But still, companies will try and explore. So here we are, I think, trying to develop the general principles. Good technology uh, can also penalize reflection. 
Uh, this is a, this, I had a bioethics museum in a few countries. This was a, on cloning. Okay, so cloning is a great stimulus for reflection. Uh, you may want to clone the great professors or your great political leaders, or teachers might want to clone great students. Uh, it could be very interesting. You object. Why do you object? Uh, what about the infertile couple? They can use some reproductive technology, but not other reproductive technology. Why do you stop with this one, get to let somebody else do this one? So it's sort of a trying to think uh, logically and consistently is one of the ideas of our ethics. We don't necessarily take uh, absolute positions on uh, uh, technology. And yeah, all sorts of issues. Animal rights, uh, nanobiotechnology, genetic medicine, um, and nuclear genomics. We can see many applications. So these uh, international guidance, guidelines uh, are available in many different languages, the UNESCO ones. One of the uh, early documents, the 97 document, talks about scientific activity. So states should take appropriate steps to provide a framework for free exercise of research on the human genome. Why did we say that? Well, actually, in some states, uh, research is uh, controlled or forbidden by the government because some policymaker says that type of research sounds unethical, that's not allowed people to do research on human embryos, for example. Uh, so it means, uh, in general, uh, you may exclude types of research just because of uh, somebody's uh, prejudice against some type. Now, if you have an ethics committee who can approve case by case for very strong need, you, you may find uh, ways to commit such research enemies. Uh, some of you uh, probably have samples from people in your freezer. Uh, yeah, I mean, not your freezer at home, your freezer in the office or the lab. Um, when I was doing research in the 1980s in, in Cambridge, for my PhD, we did a, uh, uh, when we wanted control samples, we just, uh, you know, went to the freezer to get some control samples from different patients. Uh, it was sort of widely done. We wanted to try out, you know, uh, different ideas. Now, nowadays, I think the uh, regulations, rightfully, say you should have a consent. So if a person gave that sample, they either give a specific consent for a, that test, a slightly more general consent for uh, diabetes research, or they may give a general consent, saying, I give this for medical research. And uh, as long as you have those consent documents, um, uh, you can proceed. proceed. But there's a few cases where it's interesting we have an overreaction, I think, in the, the NIH, National Institutes of Health in the US. In the 1990s, we saw sometimes very strict conditions, meaning that some types of samples may be discarded, but people, people probably didn't want their samples discarded. And sometimes the samples collected before the idea of specific informed consent for every type of use would still be useful. Let me say I wanted to look at the, if there's a, some a chemical that's been produced through an industry. I want to go back and look at the samples prior to that industry. Yeah, in the 1950s samples. And maybe I'll to see the levels of certain, uh, certain types of damage certain types of pollutant, I'm going to have to get samples uh, if I want to understand that quite important public health issue. Uh, if we just simply destroy those samples, we wouldn't be able to go back and see what it was like prior to uh, certain, uh, certain things being done. Um, 
limitations to the principles of consent and confidentiality are only prescribed by law and for compelling reasons. And so if there's a compelling reason, you may allow it, but generally these principles are absolute. One of the uh, uh, genetic projects I was involved in is the haplotype mapping project. I don't know if you've heard of the HAP map. It is uh, trying to find the, uh, uh, it's a map of human variation. And so I, I was responsible for the second examples in Japan. I do most of my professional life in Japan. And so we developed the community engagement and informed consent. How do we protect people? So if you want to use a, a hat map samples, these are freely available from a Coriol repository in the United States. Uh, and the initial samples were on a, a European, which is Nigerian population, uh, a uh, white European sample in France, uh, Han Chinese, and Japan. We actually, in the sampling, we had information seminars, uh, and we protected the privacy in several ways. Uh, one is that no names were kept from the sample. Uh, the informed consent sign was, form was signed, but no labeling was made of the tube. Another way was only 60% uh, of the tubes randomly were used to make cell lines. So even if you gave your blood, you wouldn't know if your blood is actually in the, uh, the selection that we chose. And so, and uh, we never disclosed the locations where we collected the sample. So we, we didn't disclose where these meetings were held, except to say it's in Tokyo area. And so that was some of the ways to protect uh, the privacy of the people. Um, and so we collected about two, uh, in the end, 270 DNA samples from the four populations were collected. There's no direct benefits to the donors. Uh, medical research might help. Uh, the idea that the samples were stored as cell line for access to researchers around the world meant we had to explain to people. This is what may happen to your blood. Your cell line is going to be used as a uh, control population for a non-diseased uh, Japanese sample. So we had the LC working group uh, coordinate with the University of Tokyo, we did the informed consent, blood drawing, cell line establishment, and analysis. Ethics committees, uh, I'm sure you have an ethics committee in your institution. Uh, there are guidebooks. These are guidebooks uh, from UNESCO on establishing ethics committees. There is also some guidebooks from uh, TDR, from the Disease Research Program of the uh, World Bank, WHO and UNDP, and uh, others, of course. Uh, some of you might be interested in the details. This is a, in uh, American University of Sovereign Nations, we have an uh, institutional review board. In the United States, institutional review boards uh, can be accredited by two agencies. One is the Office of Human Research Subject Protection, and one is the Food and Drug Administration. So we have a, we have accreditation by both agencies because in the future, if any of our researchers develop products, testing uh, on people, then uh, FDA approval is required. If there's general research knowledge, that just the Office of Human Research Subject Protection is, uh, is required. But they have the both. And there's all sorts of federal regulations, and then they deal with your informed consent. Uh, for example, is it obtained in writing? Is it obtained orally? Do you have a witness? This is not applicable because it's in writing. Uh, waiver of informed consent requested? No. If sometimes you may request the waiver. You know, the data is not any risk, and it's going to be anonymous. Uh, you may not need to have the consent. Um, different sorts of questions. In uh, research that our students do, that involves human subjects, um, 
he was to try to get them to take the ethics committee approval from a host institution where they are. Uh, if they're in an institution, such as in this hospital, they should get. And if they, get, they could also get from the National Ethics Committee or the Bangladesh Bioethics Society Ethics Committee in this case. Um, but generally, by, if it's a rather routine uh, procedure, then the Institutional Ethics Committee uh, should be sufficient. If, but some institutions do not have ethics committees. So uh, that's, uh, that's it. We're trying to we have these umbrellas to cover. If it was a particularly controversial research, you may want the National Ethics Committee to approve. Let's say we're using a, uh, aborted fetuses for research. That could be controversial. Let's say we're using human embryos. Let's say we're using a, a xenotransplantation uh, between humans and other animals. But again, these types of issues might be necessary or desirable to receive a national uh, approval. So we have all sorts of forms here, uh, questions. They have to check this helps us to review uh, the uh, ethics. There are many challenges uh, for an application of bioethics. Much of the material is written from a particular uh, one culture, and you may need to consider do these principles apply in our own culture? That's why it's important that you have a, a national bioethics society, for example. How do we apply these uh, universal principles uh, to people from a wide range of cultures? Can we see the origins of bioethics in different all cultures as we examine the universal diversity of approaches? The common questions in life. This is a great uh, interest, uh, personally, uh, in trying to develop an understanding of the way people think and reason. But trying to understand knowledge systems and values, the interesting thing is, uh, in different times, knowledge systems were bad. So, for example, when the English were in charge here, certain forms of knowledge uh, were bad. Certain practices were bad. Uh, and the same is true in any colonization and any uh, exchange where you get the movement of the rulers of the land. They sometimes try and stop the knowledge. In bioethics, we're trying to explore uh, people's values, which may come from traditional value systems, as well as a mandalization of value systems from around the world. Some of you trained in uh, Japan, for example. Some of you trained in Thailand. Some trained in America. And as you train, you're going to learn some of that culture, the culture of doing research and uh, being a professional. How do we then uh, learn that? Um, understand. We also look at questions of identity, where do we come from, uh, and that's important uh, when we consider the outcomes. What do people want in their life? What is a happy society? What is a healthy society? This health includes spirituality, social aspects. So these are questions. So I think together we can uh, challenge, look at some of these challenges. Uh, of ethics around the world. And that's why it's been critical to try and develop this. And uh, the last 30 years have been trying to do that by working in, uh, especially in Asia and now with indigenous peoples globally. I want to introduce, uh, this is an example, this is a tsunami warning stone in Japan. Uh, I would say this is a public health system why would I say it's a public health system? There's about 350 of these stones left in Japan. They're on the side of hills, and they usually say a big wave came, tsunami. Many people died. Don't build below the stone. That's the message. Okay. This is uh, where the, the water will come up to. And in northeastern Japan, you have a large tsunami in many valleys uh, every 60 to 80 years. 
by large, I mean 15 meters, in some valleys it will be 30 meters high. Uh, 30 meters will be underwater in this room. 15 meters, I think, will be underwater too. Uh, so, this is a public health water system. Unfortunately, what do people do? After a few years, they start to build down below the stone again, and then they get washed away again. And their farmland has to be desalinated again for a few years, and uh, the cycle goes on. And grandmothers, they teach their grandchildren a very important public health message of tsunami. The only one you need to know. What word do you teach your grandchildren if you live on the, on the next to the coast of the tsunami? Just one word. After a big earthquake, you run. That's all you need to know. You run to the hill. And we see this thing get repeated. So now I was in Padang in Indonesia, which is a, had a relatively large earthquake that is waiting for a very big one. And people don't want to give up their houses, their traditional land, the houses on the, on the coast of the city. They build uh, concrete buildings like this, and uh, within you know five to ten minutes walk of most parts of the city. Outside, they have large ramps. Not just stairs, these are ramps, about uh, five meters wide, slopes, to go up to the top. And so the people who are educated in that coastal part of the city, big earthquake, this is where you go. You run, you go up the slope to the top of the building, calculated height to be above the tsunami. And uh, it will come, maybe next year, maybe in 10 years, that they're prepared. So they prepare for disaster, so public health preparation. A part of our human security is the freedom from uh, hazard impacts. There are many uh, resources on bioethics, uh, thousands of papers uh, we've been putting online. Uh, I want to uh, briefly mention at the end uh, uh, about the university uh, I co-founded. I worked for 10 years as UNESCO Regional Advisor and then decided I'd be trying to advise governments on setting up universities and different programs implementing guidelines. Well, we really need to build up faculty and the people to teach. And I decided, we decided with an American colleague to uh, go down this university on sovereign land in the United States. What's the average life expectancy in Bangladesh? Can you tell me? 67 years. How many? 67 years. 67? For men or women? Ever? And do women live a little bit longer? Yes. Yeah. Two years? Yeah. Three years, one year long? Yeah. What's the average life expectancy in the United States? Do you know? 80. About 80, yeah? Can you guess what the average life expectancy is for a Native American in the United States? It's 49. It's a 30-year gap. 30-year gap. It's really unacceptable. In Australia, the gap between Aboriginals and the general population is 20 years. In my home country of New Zealand, the gap between the Maori and general population is 10 years. In the United States, so our goal was to establish the first ever medical school on sovereign land to try and build up uh, uh, systems because with indigenous people around the world we find this uh, tremendous gap. Uh, it's caused by many things, many, many things. So we founded it, uh, I left UNESCO and two weeks later we founded the university we got permission from the uh, Indian Council. Uh, we're a tax exempt charity by the Home Revenue Service. It took us uh, 13 months to get the uh, first four master's programs and five certificate programs licensed. And we had our first graduation from certificate program in the Asia Africa Summit Hall in Bandung. Uh, if you know your history of decolonization, uh, uh, Bandung Summit is uh, very significant. 
the uh, first graduate from the master's programs in Manila, uh, our first Native American uh, master's graduate on 29th of January, uh, which is also the day that we got permission to launch our PhD program. Um, so indigenous knowledge systems are critical. How do we make a decolonized ed educational curriculum? What that means is knowledge, tradition from every source of wisdom is uh, something to rejoice in. Best of each school. The best of Japanese medicine, the best of American medicine, the best of Bangladesh medicine, the best of uh, Zulu medicine. Try and put it together, try and make it evidence-based so that the evidence of what's working for a healthy spirituality can be in the kind. Um, we have a right to education in all traditions. We can't just be offering education in one you know, one tradition. Uh, I rejoined uh, my colleague who was the Vice Director of the United Nations University. So we were both trying to think of something as a post-UN project. To kind of think of something we could, uh, we thought was critical, um, but unfortunately the UN was not uh, doing. Our graduate programs are here, uh, and uh, we have uh, quite a few students. I was very surprised that uh, here am I, I'm a New Zealander, the Vietnam is from India, we're faculty from around the world. We established the first master's in public health program on Native American land. No, it's so strange, and why is it so late? And that's probably the reason, one of the reasons for this great life expectancy gap. Um, that's our courses. Masters in Bioethics and Global Public Health. This is my main academic field. Uh, we started in the, in the last 18 months. It is the largest bioethics program globally. Um, PhD program. So both masters programs can lead on to the PhD. I was also surprised we are the first doctoral program for any subject on Native American land in the United States. There are 560 reservations in the United States. 560. They have some, they have 26 tribal colleges offering two year degrees or two or three years on these 560. Uh, we're, we're a graduate school so we're offering it like that. We are independent. Uh, we're not dependent on federal money or being told what to do. Uh, it does mean we are poor, okay? But we are free, uh, and I think that's true. And elective courses in many, many areas. All sorts of master's graduates, um, you know, many sorts of things. Um, traditional medicine I think it is very useful. I mean, 80% of the world uh, population uses traditional medicine as a primary medicine, according to WHO. Um, this is the uh, traditional doctor here of Nelson Mandela. This is his home. He's actually an eye doctor, uh, primarily, but covers the whole body. And he learns traditional medicine, he's learned from the, uh, uh, in Peru, in China, in India, and of course he's familiar in Africa, and he accepts students from any tradition, because he thinks it's, it's all very interesting. So if anyone wants to go to Pretoria in South Africa, go home uh, and learn. And he always has a medicinal herb garden, which I have one of these in Thailand, uh, trying to learn. So this is sort of, we have these uh, different systems. And the next of our course on indigenous medicine we're doing in Rwanda, uh, with colleagues. We did this uh, in South Africa uh, next month. So we're very proud to have many cooperation agreements that make it possible for us to work. Uh, through my life, I guess, working with many uh, colleagues around the world, uh, we've had a lot of goodwill. Uh, to bring this together. Uh, we have 
uh, is our government, governor's chart. Uh, Shamima is one of our board of governors. Our board of governors from uh, around the world, uh, many continents, uh, and we have a faculty of 80 at the moment. But almost all the faculty are full time in another university in 40 countries. So they give their time. It also means we can go and do the courses in the university for the credit of our degree. Because it's, I think it's much more interesting as a delivery mechanism for our courses that you don't have just the, uh, we have, you know, Skype lectures or Adobe Connect lectures, but rather to have an in-person face-to-face and bring people from different cultures together and a dialogue. Our board of trustees are all indigenous people. Um, we have 100 students currently uh, from 30 countries. Uh, well, we have some students who, and sometimes we have to be flexible. Uh, uh, currently, uh, a student from the Yemen, a medical doctor, is in Yemen. What's happening in Yemen now? It's been a war for a year. He's busy trying to help people to save himself. Uh, he sometimes joins our class as well. Uh, the, so the talent will look, you just take it when it settles down. Unfortunately, Yemen is such a disaster at the moment. Um, this is a, a faculty you can find on a brochure, you can find their photographs, and um, there is also one of our faculty. We have another Masters of Science in Sustainability just opened. Uh, some of our graduates. For those of you who are interested, um, in 1995, I was one of the founders of the Asian Biophysics Association, and we tried to have a conference every year. The 17th will be held in Jakarta uh, in UGM uh, in November. Uh, we have uh, these occasions to try and build up people's uh, capacity to discuss and report and design useful work in research ethics or uh, bioethics. And what was quite critical, I think, was to establish this. At the beginning of 1995, the reason we were doing it is uh, I was based in Japan at that time. Um, and fortunately, many people said, why do, is a bioethics People, why are the Biophysics Society members only translating this United States textbook into Japanese? And that's Biophysics. And so, fortunately, some of us tried to say, well, let's develop studies of a population. Let's understand our ideas and develop indigenous research. And that's what we've done. Now we have, uh, I would say, 3,000 papers developed through the association in the last uh, uh, 25 years. Uh, so this is one of the ways and that, uh, that we can try and build up capacity. Uh, so that's our website. And if you want, here yeah, we have a journal as well. We're a member of the United with the United Nations Academic Impact, be recognized by the UN as a partner, uh, with a strong background, I guess, from the UN to try and develop international policy reflection as well. But our uh, interest is in uh, research policy and of course teaching. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your patience. I will welcome any questions. And uh, uh, thank you for being with us. I, I'd also like to of course express thank you to Faria for introducing us to the university. She's uh, joined our program a couple months ago, thanks uh, to Shabina's introduction, and is one of the very active uh, participants in our class, process study, possibly the same here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mayorita. We are very happy that now we have with us Dr. Mohan Shaikhuddin Shikhar, Pro Vice Chancellor of Research and Development from Mudu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. So may I request Professor Shaikhuddin Shikhar sir to say a few words. Yeah, I think this is a leader.